Please turn in your Bibles this morning to the ninth chapter of the book of Mark. Mark is one of the Gospels. You'll find the Gospels at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The chapters are the large numbers and the verses are the small numbers. This morning we're going to be focusing our attention on verses 30 to 41 of the ninth chapter of the book of Mark. I, I love summer. It's a special time. I've always loved summer because largely summer is a time where you get to spend even more time outside and you don't have school. And uh, it's a win-win, although um, as much as I think we all uh, like the fact that there's usually a break from school in the summers, I'm thinking about canceling that and uh, making some tests myself because it seems like uh, in our home there are, there's a conspiracy to, uh, to, to remind me that lessons have to be taught repeatedly. Because I'm pretty sure that no matter what form the test is in, whether it's in long essay, short answer, multiple choice, you, you can pick the format. I'm pretty sure that if I were to give everyone in, in our home a test that would ask questions, really tricky questions like this, when you move from inside to outside or outside to inside through a door, what is the first thing you should do after moving inside or outside through said door. I'm pretty sure that everyone would be able to select or come up with the appropriate and correct answer. But what, I'm, what I'm being reminded of over and over again is that there is a big difference between a, being able to correctly state a fact and actually having your life changed and your behavior modified in order to bring yourself in compliance with said truth. And um, I, I tend to get a little annoyed. I know I'm probably just really weird, but I, I don't like to say the same things over and over again. And I get a little frustrated. Another question I would put on that test is, after every meal, whose responsibility is it to pick up your plate? And again, I'm pretty sure everyone would know the answer. Another question, you guys can probably see, I've been thinking a little too much about this. <laughs> uh, another question I would have on there was, is, before you go to bed, what are essential tasks that must be completed? Before you uh, proclaim to your parents, myself, that you are ready for bed and have completed every task necessary. It seems that these things, even though they might be able to correctly be answered on a, on a written test, seem to be lessons that have to be learned over and over and over again on a daily basis, which requires somebody to teach those lessons over and over and over again on a daily basis. Now, the truth is that's not something that we outgrow we continue in that kind of learning process over and over again. And, and uh, uh, honestly, if I look at myself, I'm pretty good at answering right on tests. But I'm not necessarily nearly as good at living my life according to the things that I know to be true. In our text today, we find the disciples in a situation where they are confronted again with a simple Truth that I'm pretty sure if they were to fill out a test, they would be able to get the blanks correct. But it's a lesson that they are not learning for the first time. They're learning it again. And if you're reading through the Gospel of Mark and reading ahead, you know that this is a lesson that Jesus is going to bring them back around to again. And so let's uh, look at this lesson that Jesus brings before his disciples together. We find it written in God's Word, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 41. This is the Word of the Lord. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and 
When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. In these verses we see Jesus teaching his disciples again about the true nature of his mission. If you read through the the Gospel of Mark from the beginning to the end, which you can do in a couple hours, uh, you can kind of notice a couple of the things that uh, kind of flow together in the story that are easy to miss if you just kind of zero in on a section like we often do on Sunday mornings. And so it's good to kind of of step back every now and then and get a, a broader view. But as Mark is telling this story, several things kind of pop out over and over again. One is that the identity of Jesus is revealed from the very beginning. Mark introduces us to Jesus who is the Christ. Here we have the Messiah, Jesus, the King. And then after that, we read about Jesus' interaction with his disciples. And his disciples are able to kind of grasp that eventually, but it's taken them a while. In fact, one of the ironic twists as you read through here, Mark is kind of presenting it, the people who get Jesus' identity correct more often than anyone else are the demons. And so finally then the disciples get to a place where they have a a better understanding of who Jesus is. But then we find out that they have a really, really bad idea about what he has come to accomplish. So they finally get his identity correct, and now Jesus begins to kind of dive in further and teach them what he has come to accomplish. And what we find is Jesus being extremely blunt, extremely simple, and coming to his disciples to help them develop a right understanding of why the Messiah came, what Jesus had come to accomplish. And back in exactly one chapter over, chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus gets his disciples together, and we looked at this several weeks ago, and he began to teach them in very simple terms that he was to suffer, he was to die, and then he would be raised. And what we find today is is Jesus doing exactly the same thing. This is repeat lesson. He's coming back, and as school is called into session, and the teacher comes in, he's like, you can leave your books closed because we're covering the same material again. I want to make sure that you understand this. That's what Jesus is doing here. And it's important also, as we notice the setting and what's taking place here, um, you notice that in the previous part of what, what we were hearing about what Jesus was doing, there was a, a lot of amazing things in Jesus because of those amazing things, whether he was making blind people see again, deaf people to hear again, lame people to walk again, um, feeding people, casting out demons. All those things were amazing things that caused a lot of attention. And wherever Jesus went, there were these crowds that were almost overwhelming, overwhelming him. So Jesus and the disciples had lived very public lives with a lot of attention. And then here we see a shift. As Jesus shifts his focus from the crowds and the multitudes to zero in on his disciples, to make sure that they know and understand these things. And so back in chapter 8, when Jesus was teaching his disciples, it wasn't some big... um, 
big experience in front of a huge crowd, Jesus here is shifting his attention, and we see it really plainly in our text this morning. Verse 30 says, And they went out from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples. And so what we find here is Jesus, who was normally a very public figure, and even when he was tired and worn out and hungry, along with his disciples, and a crowd would show up, he would be overwhelmed by compassion, and he would give attention to the crowds and teach them. But now Jesus is kind of hiding. He's incognito. He's avoiding the crowds and and staying out of the public eye. And there's no question why. It's because he is zeroing and he wants his disciples to understand the truth about why Jesus had come. And this is what Jesus taught them. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. Now on the surface, it sounds like a very simple lesson. There's three, three things that you need to remember. Jesus is going to be handed over, delivered over to men. He's going to die, and three days later, he's going to rise. Very similar to what Jesus had covered in the previous lesson. He's teaching them that this is not any kind of surprise. This is a part of the, God's eternal plan to bring glory to his name by taking people who were lost and broken and enemies, people who had sinned against God and rebelled against him over and over again. God was delivering his son into the hands of sinful men to accomplish the sacrifice, the substitute that needed to be had in order for those enemies to become the sons and children of God. And He's beginning to to unpack this. This is why the Messiah has come. The Messiah hasn't come to establish his earthly kingdom right then and there, which is really what the disciples were expecting. But the Messiah had come to accomplish a greater mission, to fulfill a greater need. And he's teaching them that the Messiah has indeed come to be exalted, to demonstrate true greatness, to rise and overcome the grave. But the path to that greatness first deals with an amazing and utter humiliation. The King of kings and the Lord of lords was going to suffer at the hands of his enemies. He was going to be killed unjustly. And this all was part of God's plan. God's plan to deal with the amazing and terrible problem of sin in this world. And by now, as Jesus has taught about sin, taught about faith, taught about sacrifice and all these things, you would think that his disciples would have been able to kind of put the pieces together. But instead, what do we find out? Verse 32 says, But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now, on, on one hand, it, that's a little surprising. But on the other hand, we, we have to realize that we have a, an amazing advantage. We have the ability to look back on history, being able to read the whole story, to know where the rest is going and what happened. But for the disciples, they, they had snippets here and there of the prophets and the promises of the, of the glory of the Messiah, of the rescue that the Messiah was going to bring. And they were, they were, their minds would often go back to Moses and the delivery and the rescue that, that Moses brought to the Israelites when they were in bondage to Egypt. And they would often compare that to the bondage that they were experiencing under the hand of Rome. And so they would, would think that the Messiah has come to rescue them from Rome, to, to bring them the things that they thought they needed the most. Us, as we look back and we have the the benefit, if if you're familiar with the story of Christianity, of knowing that God's plan was much bigger than rescuing people from Roman oppression. In fact, you, you should be able to go to almost any Christian or anybody familiar with the Christian faith and ask them, what is the greatest, the one most significant, important event from the Christian perspective in all of history? And what would the answer be? 
almost unanimously, it would be the cross of Jesus Christ. And what we have, even in that simple answer, is the fact that what, mo- what many, many people correctly identify as the greatest moment in human history is a visible, surprising, utter humiliation. From anybody's perspective, a man hanging on a cross was not an amazing part of history. It would be a discouraging part of history, an embarrassing part of history. It would look more like a failure than a success. And so we shouldn't be completely surprised when the disciples had a really difficult time understanding that Jesus, the one that they had spent their the last several years with, the one that they, they had seen do all these amazing things by his own voice, the wind and the waves obeyed him. This amazing power put on display over and over again didn't lead them to think of utter humiliation. They led them to think of complete and total exaltation. And they were on board with that because if Jesus was going to be lifted up high and exalted and they were with Jesus, what does that mean for them? Hey, they're all going to be on board a story that ends that way. But now things are becoming a little confused because as they can imagine and they can picture in their minds what it would look like for Jesus to be exalted, to have the power that he deserves, to be recognized for who he is and what what he is. But when Jesus is telling them that this greatness, this path to greatness involves Complete and utter humiliation. Death at the hands of wicked, sinful people. That was a difficult thing to comprehend. And honestly, even as we look back on this, it's, it's difficult for us to understand now too. And so I say that to, to help us understand that the disciples here are not exceptional idiots. They are not that much different than we are. And so we shouldn't be completely astounded by their lack of understanding and their failure to pass this lesson that Jesus is giving them. And it's also a little surprising as you think about this. The disciples were normally full of questions, weren't they? Jesus would tell a story and it would be like, oh, well, obviously they should know what that means. A farmer going out and spreading seed and Different responses by the different soils. Oh, sure, I know what's going on there. The disciples, what's, what are you talking about? Uh, I don't get that. Can you explain that to us? Normally, they were really quick with, an, with questions. They wanted to know. They were asking Jesus to explain all these different things. And here it comes to this really important thing, this lesson that Jesus is bringing back and, and laying before them a second time. And all of a sudden, they're all speechless, including the loud mouth of the group, Right? Peter normally has never suffered from a lack of anything to say. If he suffers from anything, it's foot and mouth syndrome. The only time he just opens his mouth, takes out one foot, puts another one in. In fact, that actually might be one of the reasons why none of the disciples were willing to ask for an explanation. Because it probably would have been pretty raw in all of their minds what happened at lesson number one. When Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to raise again to to life. None of the disciples were on board with that plan, but Peter was the one who opened his mouth. He took Jesus to the side and was like, going to correct Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus' response was? It was, get behind me, Satan. It was a harsh rebuke. Because Peter was enacting and and, and voicing opposition to God's plan. And that's what Satan does. And so that would have been in the minds of all the disciples. And so I can kind of understand why none of them were willing to admit that they didn't know what Jesus was talking about. They weren't big fans of it. And they had a lot of questions. I mean, you guys, even even the, the adults in the room can probably remember a time in school where you knew you should know the answer, and if the class had been paying attention, they would know the answer, but no one is willing to be the one to raise their hand and be like, 
Uh, I think we missed something. Can you explain that again? No one wants to be that guy who admits that they weren't paying attention, that they don't understand it, although everyone is also in the same boat. And so that's what we find the disciples in this situation. But pretty soon, even without their question, we find opportunity for Jesus to explain further what it looks like to find true greatness through humility. Before they weren't willing to ask the question that should have been asked, now they're not willing to answer a question that they should be able to answer. So Jesus asks them another question, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And here we see another example, and we're really thankful for God and his word revealing to us the truth about human nature. Because it's really easy to kind of look at these 12 men and think that after all this time with Jesus, they must have been really polished and refined. But the way that Mark tells us this picture, we see that they weren't, they, they, they were pretty childish on many levels. And so when you remember um, in the previous uh, text, um, and this is kind of the, the situation, what we're, what we're dealing with, we had Jesus giving this lesson number one, and uh, Peter saying, uh, no, I don't think so, and that didn't go well. Then shortly after that, Peter, James, and John go with Jesus up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they see and experience this amazing thing, and they start talking and saying things that don't make any sense because they can't keep their mouth shut. And what does God say? This is my son. Listen to him. And then they come down from the mountain, and they find out that the other disciples had, uh, are arguing because they can't cast out a demon. Jesus cast out the demon. And then we get to this section here, where again, the disciples are found to be arguing. And so you're noticing a theme here. The the disciples miss out on lessons and they argue a lot. And it's not really presenting the disciples in a very positive light. And it gets a little worse because we find out what they're arguing about here is about who is the greatest. Jesus had just talked to them about how he was going to be humbled. He was going to humble himself and all they could think about was how they were trying to exalt themselves. The, uh, the contrast here is almost ironic. You can kind of imagine, though, the temptation would have been there. Because what had happened? Yet three of the nine were up on the mountain with Jesus and saw this amazing glory of Jesus, saw the prophet and the law revealed and Moses and Elijah, heard the voice of God, And on the way down, remember what Jesus told them? Don't talk about this. We we don't know exactly what the reasoning there was, but Jesus clearly instructed those disciples not to talk about what they had seen and witnessed up there on the mountain. Can you imagine how that went over with the group? So what, what happened? What was it like? Can't tell you. I would, but, and it was really, really amazing, but, but, I mean, Jesus told us, you know, we always listen to what Jesus says, told us not to talk, but man, oh. yeah, if only you could have been there. You, you can imagine how some of those conversations went and why they would have been vying for, all right, like, all right, well, you three, you think that you're so great, but and the conversations uh, would have gone and one up them uh, one one after the other they're demonstrating the kind of response that was typical in their culture they they weren't doing anything completely out of the ordinary we we do it today but it was especially popular and, and accepted in their in their culture which is a kind of like an honor culture but the idea that you, you would um, anytime you would gather together in a group, it would be, you would be thinking about the status of the people in the group. And where you would sit and who you would sit by were all very, very important because it had to do with your status. You wouldn't want to sit next to somebody who had a lower status than you because that would bring you down with them. 
You'd always want to associate with people that had a higher status than you. And if that's how you're thinking, you're always going to be thinking about how you can advance and how you can be seen as better than you used to be seen and, and associate yourselves with, with people that were of higher ranking in, in so, social status than you. And that's what the disciples were doing here. Vying for positions of respect and authority and power. So what does Jesus do? We'd already seen that Jesus, as he was traveling with his disciples, had intentionally taught them about his mission. Now we see Jesus again intentionally teaching his disciples. Very specifically, the the wordage and and the frame and the picture that we're given here in Mark lets us know that Jesus is again bringing school into session. When it says, and he sat down and called them to him, that is a a term um, for a teacher, uh, a a respected teacher, bringing his uh, class together, those who were following him. He called the twelve and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Here we see Jesus introducing the lesson of this meeting. It's a great paradox. If you want to be great, you must be a servant. And this isn't the first time that Jesus has used a paradox to teach a lesson. A paradox is an apparently contradictory statement that catches your attention. Two things that don't seem like they should both be true, but they are. Warren Wiersbe describes uh, a paradox helpfully when he says this. A paradox is a statement that attracts attention because it seems to be contradictory. It arouses curiosity, and we become puzzled. But as we meditate on the statement, we go deeper into some important facet of life, and we learn something new. Paradoxes are marvelous instructors. And so Jesus has done this before. You want to save your life? What do you need to do? Lose it. You want to become rich? become poor. You want to become great? Here he says you need to be a servant. You want to be the first? You want to be the first among this group? Head to the back of the line. Jesus is saying this and it catches your attention because it seems like it doesn't make any sense. It seems like this is an impossible statement. But if you remember what he had just taught, you remember that it's absolutely true. Jesus had just described the greatest accomplishment and moment in history, his death, burial, and resurrection. That path to greatness involved serving others. It involved a demonstration of complete humility. And so therefore, the path to true greatness involves serving others and humbling others yourself. And here he takes that lesson and brings it home to his disciples in a way that they can understand. They don't understand the mission of Jesus and they reveal that in their behavior because they are not willing to align their thinking in the same terminology and the same ideas and values that Jesus is telling them. He's saying, this is where I'm going and if you want to go there, this is what it looks like to get there. Humble yourself and serve others. And he sees an opportunity for him to teach and correct his disciples, and that's what he does here. But notice that he doesn't do what we might think he would do. Jesus doesn't say, stop desiring greatness. We almost would would expect that, wouldn't we? But the desire of greatness is not wrong in and of itself. What Jesus is doing here is he's saying, we all desire greatness, But let me tell you the truth about how to get it. You're going about it as if you can achieve greatness by your own means, your own methodology about climbing the the, the order and the status and the rank within groups to to get to a place where you think you're great. Let me tell you the truth. In God's kingdom, the path to greatness comes from becoming a servant. We're made in the image of God, and part of that 
is that we do want greatness. We want to achieve great things. We want to be recognized. We want to be honored. We want people to notice what we've done. We're all born that way. And so you can imagine, you can think about this and identify with it and remember it. When, when you're four or five or six-year-old comes to you with a drawing that they've just spent at least like five minutes laboring over, and they show it to you, what do you have to do? You have to build them up. You have to say words of, of honor and recognition. Wow, it's amazing. What is it? You, and they're, they're, they're going to stand there and wait with expectant ears, listening for those words that build up and encourage. They want to be validated. They want to find meaning and greatness and significance in life. We all do. Have you ever thought of why everyone, no matter what culture, no matter what age, no matter where in the world or in history you find yourself, everyone wants to be significant. They all want greatness. Why? It's part of the way that God made us. We all want it, but sin came into the world, and when sin entered the world, we became upside down. Our idea of what it means to be great became completely contrary to God's plan for greatness. And so when, when we would think about what is, what is the path to greatness, how do I become great? How do I find significance and meaning and value in my life? What are the things that we tend to go to? In my personal accomplishments, my achievements, I'm going to work really, really hard at this. I'm going to get really, really good grades because then I'm going to be seen and recognized as great as I feel I am. I'm going to work really, really hard at sports. I'm going to work really, really hard at advancing in my career. I'm going to do whatever it takes to succeed so that I can find that significance that I long for. You know, God is truly significant, and he longs for glory. And that's a good thing. God wants glory. He wants us to glorify him. He wants us to recognize and to say the truth about how amazing he is and recognize all the things that he has done. He is pleased when we do those things, when we acknowledge his goodness. And as creatures made in his image, we desire those same things too. So don't abolish and abandon any pursuit of greatness, but instead correct and reorient your definition of greatness. And that's what Jesus is doing to his disciples here. And if you were to look forward to the third time that Jesus teaches his disciples this lesson, we'll be there in, a, in several weeks. He goes over this material again. He tells them again that the path of true greatness comes through suffering and death. And then he says in a very beautiful and profound and succinct way what his mission is, why he came. We find that in Mark 10, verse 45, where Jesus told his disciples, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That is the mission of the Messiah. He came to serve. And this wasn't something that Jesus just spoke of every now and then, but his whole life was about this. He was always serving. He was always putting this on display. Jesus came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And this is, this is why we call the, what we're reading here good news. Mark is the gospel of Mark, the gospel according to Mark. It's good news to everyone about who Jesus is and what he has come to accomplish and what he has accomplished Jesus told his disciples and wanted them to learn and understand very clearly what we also desperately need to understand. That the Messiah, the Son of God, was sent here to serve us. To serve us by meeting our greatest need. We need to be ransomed. I'm pretty sure that if you go to anybody on the street and ask them what your greatest need is, no one is going to say, I need to be ransomed. But that's the truth. From a spiritual perspective, God makes it, paints a really clear picture of why we need to be ransomed. Because we're all born into this world corrupted by sin, we are in bondage to sin. 
Everything we do flows from our sinful heart. So that means that even when we do good things, it is motivated by a selfish desire to look good or to appear good or to be better than other people. So even the good things that we do are tainted and corrupted. So we're helplessly lost, separated from God. We need to be ransomed. We are in bondage. We are captured and controlled by sin. And the The other side is life, life and liberty through Jesus Christ and Jesus to bring us from bondage and bring us into freedom and life came to serve. And he demonstrated the heart of service in the most profound and beautiful way possible. He was willing to serve to the point of death. He humbled himself and he took as God's servant to accomplish his amazing mission to bring salvation to lost, broken people. He took the punishment that we deserve so that we can experience the life that he deserved. Jesus is our ransom payer. Jesus came to serve and to be that ransom so that he could, knowing that Jesus has accomplished what we could never accomplish, He has paid the price so that we can be free. We can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness and brought into his glorious light. And friends, if you're here and and you don't understand what that means, don't be like the disciples and be afraid to ask those questions. If you're here and you would like to know more, the person who invited you, anybody you saw up on the stage here, anybody who greeted you in the lobby or on the parking lot, any of those would would be thrilled to be able to show you even clearer from Scripture what it means and what God has done so that you can be brought into his family, so your sins can be forgiven and you can be identified as one of God's children. That's the good news. And as God's children, we can ascribe to the right view of greatness. We can desire to Please, God, and bring glory to his name by living a life that's not all about me, but it's about him, his kingdom, his plans. This is an amazing lesson, and I hope that none of us miss out on the truth and how much this can change our lives. To help drive the point home, Jesus uh, does what any good teacher does and does an object lesson. And he brought a child from the home. They were, they were in somebody's house. They weren't out on, in a public place, remember? He brought a child. He brought him in and held the child in his arms. And he told his disciples, this is what it looks like to receive me. Now, in uh, in our day and age, children are viewed as kings and queens, and they run most of our homes. But that was not the way it was back then. When it comes to a society that ranks everything by status and recognition and power and authority, children were viewed as zeros. One of the reasons was because many, many, many children never made it past the age of five or eight. And so they were almost viewed as insignificant. In fact, they were viewed as insignificant. What Jesus is doing here is revealing that if you want to be great in my kingdom, you won't seek after the people who will help your agenda, who will help you rise in power and prestige. You will embrace me by embracing the nobodies around you, the people who are insignificant, the people who will not help you, that's what it means to truly demonstrate greatness. Jesus continues his time in, in teaching because John brings up an example. He says, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. You notice what was on the minds? What was offensive about this? It wasn't because of what they were doing. In fact, here we get kind of another example of almost humorous irony. What happened when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration? We saw the disciples unable to cast out demons. Now John tells the story about 
this other guy who was able to cast out demons, and they were upset with him because he could do what they couldn't do. And they tried to stop him, and I really wish I could, uh, could have seen that and known what that looked like. What is it? The disciples here were thinking about themselves, and they viewed this other person who was accomplishing the same things they were doing, and really clearly from the text here, in the same power that they were accomplishing with. This man wasn't some kind of enemy or an opposition. This man was another follower of Christ. He just wasn't one of the twelve. And so rather than looking at this man and recognizing that he's doing the same things that we're doing by the same power that we're doing it and looking at him and, and seeing a companion, a co-laborer, somebody who's going to the same place, whose mission is the same, and going in it and seeking to encourage each other and help him and, and rejoice in his accomplishments. Instead, what happens? They see him as a threat and they want to put an end to what he's doing. And this is one of the things that's revealed in this story. We see the pride of the disciples in contrasted with uh, the humility of Jesus. And pride and humility are opposites. And all, so often, this is what happens. Pride changes the way that we think about other people. And so in the first example, we see these 12 people who have been, they're close friends, they've been following Jesus together, and they should have come to the place where they could rejoice when somebody got to go up on the mountain and they didn't. Instead of being angry and jealous, they could be happy for that person. But instead of doing that, instead of having a, an experience that was encouraging and unifying, they ended up fighting and arguing them in, in the midst. It brought division. Pride brings division where there should be unity. And we look here. Pride brings exclusivity where there should be unity. These disciples looked and instead of recognizing what was going on, they saw a potential threat. Again, they were focusing on themselves instead of focusing on Jesus. And if you want to know, if you are pursuing, if you are thinking about greatness from God's perspective, if you have if, if latched on to this truth that Jesus was teaching his disciples, the true greatness comes through serving others humbly. Think about the way that you view other people. If you view other people as a means to an end, as obstacles to overcome, as people to use, pawns to use, and your schemes and your plans, then you haven't got the lesson. As much as you might want unity, everything you're doing is going to create division and strife. If you view other people as a threat because they don't belong to your club, then you are not embracing the truth about greatness. So Jesus, again, brings another object lesson to close his lesson with. It's profound and simple. Since I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Jesus does two things in this simple object lesson. He lets them know that being great and doing great things in the kingdom of God doesn't always look as amazing as casting out demons, but it often looks as simple and ordinary as giving someone a cup of water. You want to do great things for the kingdom of God? Jesus is saying, remember what true greatness looks like. It comes from serving. It's not about public displays. It's not about recognition. It's not about power and respect. You want your reward in heaven? Give someone a cup of water in my name. And the second thing he does in this object lessons, he keeps the focus where it needs to be. He brings them the motivation. It's not the cup of water that matters. It's the motivation behind it. When John was telling the story, he, he didn't even, it seemed like he didn't even know better, like he should have hidden the motivation, but he, he clearly says he was upset because they weren't following us. He should have said, we were concerned because he didn't look like he was following you, Jesus, but that's not at all what was going on. And so Jesus brings it back here, and, and three times in this text, we see the phrase, in his name or in my name. And what Jesus is doing is reminding his disciples that it's not about their acts of service. It's not about their aspirations of greatness. It's about him. 
if we want to achieve true greatness, if we want to live a life that really has significance and meaning, we will understand that everything that we do needs to be flow from a motivation that is rooted in the fact that it's not about me. It's about him. When our motivation is correct and lined up with his plan and his agenda, then doing something as simple as receiving a child or offering someone a cup of water, those things have meaning and significance and value. Those things that appear to be insignificant lead to real greatness. We should desire to be great. Great in God's kingdom. Great God's way. We must also realize that as, just as the disciples had to learn this lesson over and over and over again, when it comes to what we are living for, what we are looking for, for our significance, what we think is going to be great for us to accomplish, daily we have to realign our idea about greatness with God's word. This isn't a lesson that you can just answer correctly time and have it all figured out, but it's a lesson that we need to be relearning on a continual daily basis. And I'm pretty certain that opportunities will present themselves today. In fact, God will bring opportunities into our lives today to serve others. Opportunities to demonstrate acts of service motivated by a desire to follow God's plan for greatness by serving others. And don't be surprised when God moves in your life to teach you this truth over and over and over again. Be ready and welcome those lessons and learn these things over and over again. We serve a patient Savior, and for that, we are grateful. Let's pray to him now. Thank you.